Hello, friends, and welcome to the next episode of Chapters. Chapters is uh, on Armstrong Television, and it's a show that profiles authors, publishers, and editors in the tri-state area. And we're delighted to have you with us today and to welcome John Bilheimer, our author for today. John is uh, a hometown boy, now lives in California. He is... Um, has an engineering degree, a PhD from Stanford, and for 30 years was vice president of a small consulting firm specializing in transportation research. When an early research project brought him back to West Virginia, he was inspired to write the characters of his first novel, The Contrary Blues. It's the first book in the funny and sometimes touching mystery series featuring Allison, Owen Allison. He is a failure analyst, and I'm curious to find out what a failure analyst is. He followed that with a number of books in that series, Highway Robbery, Dismal Mountain, Dry Bone Hollow, Stonewall Jackson's Elbow, and the most recent, Primary Target. Uh, this has just come out, and it has to do with West Virginia sometimes uh, dodgy voting procedures, shall we say. And then he has a second mystery series featuring Lloyd Keaton, who's a Midwestern sports writer with a gambling problem. And that debuted in 2012, Field of Schemes, and a second is called A Payer to Be Maimed Later. And no doubt there will be more of those. But we're going to talk mostly about uh, his nonfiction book today. Um, Baseball in the Blame Game is the first nonfiction book he did, and now he has written Hitchcock and the Censors, which is what we're going to really spend more time talking about than anything else. John also teaches a series of courses on film noir and the modern mystery in film and print as part of continuing studies of, at Stanford and Santa Clara Universities. Wow. That's a lot you do. That's a lot you've packed into a few years. Well, a few more years. Then a few, <laughs> more, few than more, huh? A more than few. All right, so when you were growing up here in Huntington, did you ever think about becoming a writer? No. No, I was pretty good at it in uh, high school, but I uh, was educated as an engineer, and they don't emphasize that. So. When I was working in California, I thought that part of my, I, I was sort of wasting that, that side of my education, and so I took some, some courses out there Did you? in creative writing and sent off a lot of uh, short stories, got a lot of, this was when magazines were still sending nice rejection notices, <laughs> and uh, I got a lot of rejection notices, and finally it dawned on me that what I read most are mysteries, why don't I write a mystery? And and that managed to work, so. Yeah. But I, I didn't think about it when I was growing up here in Huntington. Uh -huh. But as you'd thought about writing a mystery, then uh, it took coming back to West Virginia to give you a setting and a, and a character? No, that's, that's really true. In fact, I, uh, I had written one that didn't sell, and then I came back and I, this, you know, I grew up here, but I'd never been down in a coal mine, and one of the first things that happened when I uh, went to work for Stanford Research Institute in Bay, San Francisco Bay Area was they sent me back and uh, to try and figure out how to get coal from the mine to the market uh, more efficiently. And then I did go down in a coal mine. I was just astonished uh, by just the life of the miners. And there were people who really fascinated me who were it was those kind of mom-pop operations, you know, you'd, you'd have a little mine in your backyard and you'd bring out the coal and you'd put it over a tipple into a coal, uh, into a coal tender and you'd send it to market the same way these big coal operators mm -hmm. were doing. And I, I think they've kind of gone by the wayside now, but they fascinated me and so that played a big part in the first mystery I wrote, Contrary Blues. Mm. Contrary's a small coal country town where oh, I see. Mm -hmm. big coal <clears throat> is pulled out and uh, well when big coal pulls out the, the town goes under yes. and uh, we have a lot of those yeah but the citizens of Conway <coughs> figure out how to get a subsidy they tell the federal government they're really they're, they're running a 20 best system they really are only running two and somebody's pocketing five hundred dollars thousand dollars a year it takes the federal government a while to figure that out but when they do uh, they come to the citizens and the contrary, and they say, well, you know, federal government, we need to pay the clinic, we need to pay 
the the uh, policeman, we need to pay the library. We need to have more than we need your buses. What do you care what we use your 500000 for? And then an auditor dies under mysterious circumstances, which are this kind of circumstances. Right. Right. Mystery. Right. The mystery goes on from there. I see. But I, see. It, I thought I was writing a short story about this bus system, and I got so fascinated with the characters in the setting that I just let it, I kept asking, well, what happens next? Mm -hmm. What happens next? And uh, eventually got a novel out of it, and the novel sold, and I wrote, well, this is primary target is the sixth book in that series. Yeah, that's great. And they're all set in Appalachia? They're all set in Appalachia, yeah. All yeah. of West Virginia the, or just all over Appalachia? Well, all West Virginia. No, I it's see. all West Virginia. There's a town called Barkley, which is the center, which would be Beckley, but with a small town, you can't really use the yeah. real name. You know, a town as small as, as Beckley, if, if you call the mayor a nincompoop, <laughs> Everybody thinks you're calling the real mayor of Beckley right. a nincompoop. Right. And, you know, by the time the book comes out, there'll be a new mayor anyway, yeah. but you can't do it. So gives you Barclay, a lot more freedom to do it that yeah, other way. Barkley is really Beckley. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, so Hitchcock and the Censors is sort of a departure. Well, not entirely because you've written one other nonfiction book, but which do you prefer to write? Oh, that's hard to... It's hard to say. I, I, uh, it's a little more fun to write the mysteries because I surprise myself a lot. Uh, but the the nonfiction books, I did research for a living, and and digging into something that I'm really interested in, like the Hitchcock and the Censors, I, uh, I was, uh, I was first interested in Hitchcock because, well, you know, we were kids at the same time uh -huh. here. I, uh, uh -huh. He, uh, he was the director you recognize. I, I was an usher at the Keith Abbey Theater, and, and um, I think the first of his movies that I saw was Dial In For Murder, and there's a murder scene in there that just left the audience gasping. I was an usher at the door, and I could go and, and watch that scene and just hear the audible gasps. Uh -huh. I, I'd been a Hitchcock fan ever since, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've done both fiction and nonfiction as well, and I find that Sometimes in nonfiction, you do get kind of wrapped up in the research, mm -hmm. and you have to make yourself stop and then go write the book. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Luckily, there was a limit to the number of movies Hitchcock had, so <laughs> you know, I, exactly. I had to stop. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, so being an usher at the Keith is what started you on the road to being a film buff? Oh, I think so, sure. Sure. I... Uh, um, uh, it's interesting. I, it was, you know, how uh, if you were in high school, you you uh, wanted to play sports, and I was tall enough to be okay at basketball, but I wasn't. I couldn't think fast enough, and so I went out. Uh, it was at St. Joseph's, and I went out for basketball my sophomore year, and was the last person cut, and uh, so I. Took a job after school working at the Keith Albany, and the next basketball season rolled around. I liked being an usher better than playing basketball. I managed to play baseball because I could do that right after school, but the basketball games were mm -hmm. later in the evening. So, right. so I, I could play baseball, but decided not to play basketball. And that I really, it, it was, I, I, I enjoyed being an usher, and the money was nice. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So then you, um, started teaching a course in film. Oh, that was much later, much, much later. later. That was after I had started writing books and, and right. that was a part of the, 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 the whole mystery writing scene is a, the authors are so friendly and, and supportive that it's, it's not like, you know, if I sell one of my books, Michael Connolly isn't going to sell one of his. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's a very supportive group, and, right. and, and, and they're delightful people to be with. And, and so at some point when I started writing books, I, I uh, st started teaching in the evening school at Stanford and Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did this book come out of you teaching that class, the idea that there was enough material there about Hitchcock to write a book? No, you know, um, I know exactly where that book came from. I, a friend of mine uh, was writing mysteries 
set in the 40s and her, her protagonist was a screenwriter. And so we were at a conference in Los Angeles and she was said oh, there's this local library she wanted to go to to get some uh, some background and and it sounded sounded like it was a motion picture academy of arts and sciences they have this margaret herrick library in beverly hills got a wealth of material and so i went along and i just poking around and they they have available and and if you are an author you can investigate in fact i i think even private citizens could do it but they had all the correspondence between Hitchcock and the censors and all the correspondence between the censors and Hitchcock. Wow. And I just, because of my fascination with Hitchcock, I just uh, sat down and started reading some of these. And they were fascinating. You know, the, the production code people that, that r rode uh, roughshod over Hollywood movies between 1934 and, say, 1968, they made, in the case of Hitchcock, they made about an average of 22 demands on each film. Demands that he had to either accede to or, or bargain away in order to get his movies filmed. Mm -hmm. And he did that. It was a, a, some of the, you know, they, some of the requests were mundane, but some were just mind boggling. And, and they really affected a lot of the movies. but. But there were things he had to deal with, mm -hmm. and it was just fascinating material for me. So that's that's, that's where, where the book came, came from. from. So let's talk just a little bit about the production code. They had the most amazing list of things they wouldn't allow. I mean, it, oh, it's yeah. almost laughable when you think about how movies and even television programs are today. Tell us some of the things that they wouldn't allow. Well, the, the one that pops to mind is because I. I these talks about it. You, you couldn't show a toilet on screen. I, you know, they didn't want scenes in bathrooms. And if you had a scene in a bathroom, you couldn't show the toilet. And Hitchcock was, was <laughs> there were films ranging from Mr. and Mrs. Smith to The Wrong Man. In Mr. and Mrs. Smith, he, he didn't even show a toilet, but he had uh, a, the sound of a toilet flushing come over a dialogue where because they they, they objected to the dialogue, they couldn't show it, show, couldn't he, even hear a toilet flushing. So he used rattling pipes instead. In the wrong man, Henry, Henry Fonda is in the prison cell, and in the original uh, film coverage of it, they show the toilet in the cell. Had to take that out. Hitchcock finally overcame that, and I think it's one. Of the, in, in that period, from 34 to 68, is probably the first time that you had ever seen a toilet on screen in Psycho, because mm -hmm. Janet Lee flushes some evidence down a toilet, mm -hmm. and it's a key part of the plot. So they had to, they, the production code had to allow it, but it's probably the first time they'd ever seen a, a toilet on screen in that period. Well, uh, he had to deal with this even back in England, didn't he? He had to deal with not the the toilet business. The the English people were uh, they they had the British Board of Film Censors, and they were much more concerned with social issues. Uh, they didn't want you to discuss strikes, or mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want you to offend foreign countries. Um, whereas in America, the production code. Uh, where they were more concerned with sex and violence, mm -hmm. but he had to contend with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, the British Board of Film Censors, and there were things he wanted to film. He wanted to film a, make a film about a, a, a strike. I think it was the Sydney Street riots, and they mm -hmm. they absolutely didn't want him filming anything controversial. Mm -hmm. Did he make Lifeboat when he was in England or in America? In America. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that one, because that, that has both the social issues <coughs> yeah, in I'm it sorry. as well. Um, Lifeboat is, is really one of his better movies, and uh, it, it involves a, a group of survivors on Lifeboat. Um, they have, a, a, it's been the ship the, the survivors were on had been torpedoed by a U-boat, and the U-boat is later sunk, and the, the captain of the U-boat comes on the lifeboat. And he's played by Walter Slezak, and, and he doesn't admit to being the captain, but he is the, the he's a Nazi, and, and uh, he's the, the most competent survivor on the lifeboat. So he takes over, and uh, 
uh, he has a hidden compass so he knows where where he can lead them and and uh, he is actually leading them toward a German supply ship but they don't know that they think and uh, they the other survivors are kind of a cross-section of of the Allies. There's a rich man, there's a sailor, there's a nurse, they, and ultimately they, they figure out that, the, that they're being led astray by the Nazi, and they, they band together and kill him. It was Hitchcock's point, insofar as he made points in movies, that it took the Allies a while to get together and, and come to grips with the Nazis. And Hitchcock had the production code to deal with, but also at that time, there was the Office of War Information, and they felt that this story was really, if you didn't listen to the sound and you just watched it, it could be Nazi propaganda, because the most competent person on that boat mm -hmm. was, the, uh, was the Nazi. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, when the movie came out, at first it got pretty good reviews, and then somebody raised the issue that, well, look, you know, this is a, just, this is a, could be Nazi propaganda. And so I, the movie wasn't very popular at the time, but it has since been recognized as a What year did that one. come out? I think it was about 40, 41. So uh, no, was, no, it had to be later than that. It was, was 42 after or 40. Pearl Harbor. It was after Pearl Harbor, yeah, that's okay. right. Mm -hmm. Because the off, that's when we had an Office of War information. Before that, he had made Foreign Correspondent in 1940, and there was a isolationist trend in America, so that uh, uh, he and he, because Britain was at war, America wasn't in foreign correspondent. And foreign correspondent ends with a plea for America to wake up, mm -hmm. that was just put in at the end. And and he took some heat from that, just from Congress, who mm -hmm. uh, there was an element of Congress that didn't didn't want us to go to war. And right. uh, uh, but. That's, that's actually quite a good movie, Foreign yeah, Correspondent. Yeah. yeah. Later on, he also ran afoul of some other agencies in the government, like uh, the Department of Interior, when he wanted to form, uh, to, to work on Mount Rushmore. That's right. That's right. Yes. So uh, it wasn't they, just the sex and violence. He, he countered all kinds of problems oh, with no, all kinds the, of The Humane Association for, bir for Birds, uh, oh, yeah. the Department of the Interior. He had, to, he had to build a replica of Mount Rushmore indoors. Yeah, because uh, they didn't want shooting on the mountain, or they, the Department of the Interior, wouldn't let have, have people shooting on the mountain. And, and uh, uh, so, no, yeah, there, there were all kinds of of uh, censoring influences that that he ran into. That, but the, the main one was the production code. The, that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there were even simple words like. Um, oh, cripes, cripes geez. I mean, yes. Yeah. It just, uh, connubial. And, and the ones that... And you couldn't that, even show a married couple in the same beds. No, that's right. That's right. That that was actually... Um, you, you could in America, they did it. That was a, a British foible, but in order to export your... Uh, uh, your movies, you had to, you had to observe what, what the British Board of Film Censors wanted. And there's... I, I forget the name of the movie. I think it was The Mad Miss Manton. It was a Barbara Stanwyck film where, uh, in the American version, they, they show a, uh, a, a caretaker and his wife in bed, and they hear a noise outside, and the caretaker and his wife are in bed together, and the caretaker gets up and goes to investigate the sound. And the British wouldn't pass that because the caretaker and his wife were in the same bed together. So <laughs> rather than shoot it, what RKO did was they just dimmed the lights so much that you couldn't tell where the caretaker came from. You know, he gets up out of bed and you hear the noise, but you don't see that yeah. he's in bed with his wife. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is that it, in order to export movies from this country, he had to pay attention to the codes everywhere else. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a miracle that he got anything <laughs> passed it by is. anybody. It well, is. And amazingly, the British Board of Films, well, well America was guilty of this, too, uh, up, right up until World War II broke out, the British Board of Film Censors wouldn't let them ha have movies with Nazis as villains uh, uh, because they were offending the German nation mm -hmm. and uh, also hurting themselves at the German box office, presumably. But, but that was part of the, the concern of the British Board of Film Censors. And 
it carried over into America for that reason. When, when Hitchcock made The Lady Vanishes, the uh, villains are clearly Germanic, but he couldn't call them Germans, so he invented a company, Barovia. So the Barovians were the villains and, <laughs> <laughs> and spoke some strange argot. Yeah. That's the other thing that I think was fascinating in the book is that you've shown how he got around all of these things. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that, for instance, how he, how the give and take, sure. where, you know, what he bargained? He, he bargained, well, for instance, in Rear Window, um, there's a, this dancer across the way, uh, and the production code people objected to, uh, they, he knew they were going to come down on him for it, so he, so he filmed her in three different versions. He, the dancer was just practicing. He, he didn't have close-ups of her, but the story is that Jimmy Stewart's looking across this courtyard. and So he filmed the dancer, three different versions of this dancer, once topless from behind, once with a white negligee, and once in black. And he showed the censors the, uh, these, at first, the topless version. He said, well, you can't do that. And he said, well, oh, well gosh, I'll go back and refilm it, although he had already filmed mm -hmm. it. Uh, and said, but, but if, if I give you that, then you've got to give me this scene between uh, James Stewart and Grace Kelly. And uh, he did a lot of bargaining like that, and he became very adept at it. In fact, um, <clears throat> it, it, when he first came over, they, the, the first thing that, that uh, the the production code reviews was a script. And they would come out with the script and say, well, you can't say this and you can't say that. And, and, and when Hitchcock was starting out in America in 1940, he would just obediently take those things out. And then <clears throat> as he grew in stature, he realized that he needed bargaining chips. So uh, later in, in, one, in his glory years, I mean, starting with Rear Window and the films that, that followed, he would actually film the things they told him not to film, mostly dialogue, so that later on he could say, okay, I'll take that out, but you've got to give me this. Yeah, so it was, it, it was a lot of horse trading with him, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with Psycho, the shower scene in Psycho. Yeah, that's the one I wanted to talk about because that's, I think that's the movie that almost everybody identifies with him. Yeah, well, it, the the shower scene is probably the most famous scene in right. movie. In fact, it was voted that. Um, it's, uh, I think, 73, 74 individual takes that he's cut up into 45 pretty harrowing seconds. But if you watch it, <coughs> scene or you know, just scene by scene, you never see what what was counted as nudity, and you never see the knife touching the flesh. But it all goes by so fast, and it's harrowing. And when he showed that to the censors, there were five, they were all male, the, the, the people judging him in the production code. When he showed the two of them, <coughs> there were five censors who looked at it, and three of them saw nudity. They were convinced they saw nudity. Two of them didn't. And so Hitchcock t took the film back and, and did nothing to it. Gave it to him <laughs> two days later and said, well, I, th I, th I think I fixed it. See what you think. This time, the three that, that uh, had seen nudity didn't see it anymore, and the two that hadn't, now they saw it. <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll take out the nudity, <laughs> which wasn't there anyway, and, uh, but you gotta give me this, this scene in, with Janet Lee and John Gavin in bed at the beginning. And they said, no, no, we can't do that. And uh, so they bartered down a little, he says, well, um, leaving the nudity, but you come to the set and tell me what I have to film to make the, the bedroom scene acceptable. And they didn't show up. They, they didn't, I mean, that was something that, that they actually didn't do. They didn't want to interfere with filming. So he got away with both the uh, shower scene and the bedroom scene at the beginning. There was one, uh, there was one, well, actually there are two things that he took out of the shower scene. One was that at the very end, Janet Lee's eye sort of blinked imperceptibly so he had to cut that scene a little sooner than he wanted to but he also ha had closed on an overhead shot where he pans upward and and the he shoots down was showing Janet Lee spread eagled over the the uh, bathroom or the bathtub and uh, you could see her bare buttocks so he had to take that out because that was clearly nudity and uh, the cameraman thought that that was the most poignant 
oh, part yeah. of the scene, but but uh, he couldn't get away with that. But the, the rest of the shower scene, he managed to keep in by, by by his showing it to them until the minorities didn't see me. And yet he managed to keep in there the possibility that uh, you know there's there's untoward relationships, let's say between uh, Anthony. Um, Perkins. Perkins and his mother. Oh, yeah. He's kept in, you know, all sorts of themes that should have been much more, you know, objectionable than yeah. somebody taking a shower. Yeah, no, you know? that's it, right. It's, that's fascinating that's right. to me is how he managed to, you know, you have yeah. matricide and you've got all you, kinds of yeah, strange Yeah, they, they objected things. to incest, which was, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, Anthony Perkins playing his mother, it's kind of tough to imagine inside, but, yeah. but the earlier, I mean, there's the implication that, that the earlier relationship between mm -hmm. Perkins and his mother was a little questionable. Yeah. But no, he, he got that by the censors. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about his television shows. Did this same problem continue through the TV shows? Oh, uh, it, that's, that's interesting because it, it did. The television shows had a, uh, they were, they were under the, the National Association of Broadcasters had to approve of it. And they had a, a code that was just as strict. In fact, it was a model on the, uh, the production code. But they had, they had something extra. They had sponsors that had to be, uh, uh, <laughs> that had a, I mean, Hitchcock eventually, I mean, Hitchcock tried it, his sponsors. But the, it just television in general, the, some of the things the sponsors demanded were absurd. Uh, Chivlet, for instance, was sponsoring a show in which the dialogue talked about uh, people fording a stream. Well, they so Ford was a was <laughs> Ford was a, a rival of Chevrolet. So you couldn't say fording a stream. Uh, you had cigarette makers who who made non-filter tip cigarettes insisted that uh, villains smoke filter tip cigarettes. It was the things like that. <laughs> but the, but but Hitchcock was very clever with his TV show because. He, he would come on at the beginning and tell you what it was going to be about. And then he would come on at the end and uh, sort of wrap up. And his, his uh, shows, they were half, mostly half hour, but later they were an hour. They had twist endings in which uh, often the killer got away with, yeah. uh, with, with murder. And that wasn't allowed. So Hitchcock would come on at the end and very, very drolly explain, well, he, he or she didn't get away with it because the next time they tried that, she was caught yeah. or he was caught. Yeah. yeah. That, that was fascinating. I love the way you did this whole book because you've given us every movie with a synopsis, the problems he had with the censors, how mm. he overcame them, and then what the resulting uh, box office was or the critics. I think that's yeah. a, a brilliant way to show very clearly in many cases that Hitchcock was right about what he chose to yeah. do and how he managed to, to uh, manipulate in many cases. And, and I think um, you, you could tell us in the, bo in the battle overall, who won? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Hitchcock clearly won. I, I, in, in some cases, you might say the censors won because Oh, the plot of Rebecca, for instance, yes. it's, it's just horrible. It's a, the, it's the story it. of a man who, who kills his wife, and the only way they got it filmed was to have that wife die by accident and have the, the, the uh, husband cover it up as the same way he did in the book. Uh, the book In the book, he, uh, he kills yes, Rebecca. He kill her, yeah. and, and so the plot is a mishmash. Hitchcock handled it so well. I mean, the only way they could do it, get it filmed, was in fact it was Hitchcock's suggestion that maybe uh, Rebecca dies by accident. Uh, if you if you try and follow that plot, you just shake your head. But he he just skates you past that with mm -hmm. with it's really artist just this innate artistry, and he does that. When there were three or four films, five four or five, where he ran afoul of the dictate that evildoers must be punished. And so, in a way, you could say, well, yeah, the, the production code office won that battle, and, and the plot of Rebecca is a mishmash, but Rebecca won an Academy Award. So who, so, who won? Yeah. I mean, Hitchcock right. figured out how to, 
how to tell the story and, and get it accepted. And so I think definitely he was, he was the winner here. Yeah. The, the, the code was right in a couple of instances, yeah. but, but no. I, well, Hitchcock. it's a fascinating book, Hitchcock and the Censors, and I hope uh, everybody will pick it up as well as uh, at least one or two or all six <laughs> of the Owen Allison series. John, thank you so much for being here on Chapters today. And we want to thank the Inner Geek for their support always and uh, let you know that books by John Wilheimer are down here at the Inner Geek, as are other books from other authors that we've interviewed on chapters. This will do it for today, and I thank you all so much for watching and come back again. We'll be doing this another time. Thank you. Connect with chapters via email. Write to lp4 at zoom.email. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, and follow. All chapter episodes are available on YouTube. Visit Armstrong's YouTube channel, follow Armstrong, and look for a playlist of all the chapters programs. <laughs>